The Business of Agriculture is brought to you by Land Trust. Have you heard how landowners are increasing profitability by adding recreation to their portfolio of land use? Millions of outdoor recreators seek wide open spaces for bird watching, photography, hunting, fishing, horseback riding, and many other farm and ranch activities. Landowners are partnering with the Recreation Access Network Land Trust. Land Trust is an online platform connecting recreators with landowners for outdoor experiences on their land to increase profitability. Visit LandTrust.com slash BOA, as in Business of Agriculture, to learn more. That's LandTrust.com slash BOA. Well, greetings and welcome to another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture podcast. It's me, your host, Damian Mason, with a fantastic topic for you today. Yes, I'm going to cover this multiple times because I think it's that important. We're talking about the protein complex. We're talking about the meat industry. Uh, the Biden administration, as to for, meaning this, this at this point right now, is somewhat ambiguous about what the policies or the rules are going to be, but they've announced $1 billion. $1 billion of taxpayer money is going to go to, as they say, to make the meat industry more competitive and also bring down prices at the consumer level. Uh, my man Todd Thurman, with Swinetex, who's also my partner with the Business of Ag Success Group uh, and a frequent guest on this very podcast, and I recorded an episode discussing about whether this is misguided, whether this actually makes sense, whether it's even likely that we could do this, meaning if you're going to prop up smaller processors in the meat business, won't that then actually make meat more expensive? In other words, if I was going to uh, look at trying to make meat less expensive, I would go with the largest scale producers that are the most efficient. But there is the issue of anti-competitiveness. So is this really an issue uh, that's going to be fixed is the question of one. We know it's an issue that meat prices are going up. Is more money from the federal government going to fix that? Is it more a matter of employees and supply chain issues, which I think that it is? And also, are we going to really get to a point where we actually fix this by just throwing money at small processors, maybe the answer is breaking up the big four. But uh, also, we've seen that before with uh, Ma Bell, and it didn't really improve your price of telecommunications. So there's all sorts of issues here. So I decided to bring in a guest. His name is Jim Heimerl. Jim Heimerl is a large-scale pork producer in Ohio. He's been a client of mine. He also uh, has a beef feed yard, and he is a part owner in a meat processing facility or two. So he's going to give us his scoop. Mr. Heimer, thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having me. All right, so answer me this. Uh, real quick background about your business, because uh, I have worked for you, and I know a little bit about it, but the average person does not. Tell me what's going on. Well, I have a uh, two sons involved in a farming operation here in Ohio. Uh, we do sell a fair amount of hogs uh, at uh, about three different uh Hog operations. We are an investor in the Clemens Food Group. Uh, we do feed about 700 head of cattle, and uh, so I have a little bit of pork and, and hogs in the game, I guess. All right, Clemens Food Group is one of the big uh, processors of pork, correct? That's correct. Okay, so do they have any brand names that the average consumer would uh, recognize? Well, Hatfield would be their their largest, and they're very big on the East Coast. They have a new plant in Coldwater, Michigan, and is what caused us to be a, an investor in their group in Coldwater, Michigan. But on the East Coast, they're very big with their Hatfield brand name. So me being an Indiana guy, I remember that Coldwater, Michigan plant opened up a few years ago, and it gave us a, a big new place to take product uh, from, from this area. You being in Ohio, me being in Northeast Indiana. Opened up about, what, five years ago? Uh, I would believe four, but I guess I lose track of time. So, yeah, four to five years. Okay. And you are a part owner of that facility? Yeah, just an investor in it. I don't say part owner, but an investor in it. Okay, you're an investor in that. And you're an investor in another uh, processing facility somewhere, right? Uh, just mainly that one, yeah. Just a, a small invest in another one. Okay. So. So how many fat hogs be, uh, does Heimerol, uh pork send each uh, year? Uh, north of uh, 700,000. So about 700,000? Uh, all the plants, of all the plants, all three plants. But the, but Heimerl, your farming operation, sends about 700,000 hogs uh, to market every year, or did last year. That's correct. Okay, so then just to, to put that in perspective for the, uh, for the consumer that's listening to this or for anybody that's not in the hog business, I think we kill about 2.7 million pigs per week. Does that sound right? 
Yeah, maybe just north of that a little bit. Okay, pushing between two point seven to three million. Yeah, about three three one. Okay, so three million pigs per week get processed. You're responsible for just under one million. So you're a large scale hog producer, but even at that, you're you're about four days of three. You're about four days, three days of America's supply. Uh, it could be yes. All right, so that's still significant. Um, you're sending these hogs on a contractual arrangement. So kind of tell people how it works so that they, if they're, if they're even in, their, in the business of ag, they may not know how the hog thing works. You're a vertically integrated hog producer. You don't raise all 700,000 pigs yourself. You hire some people to do that on a contract, right? That's correct. We own some of the sows, and then we work with other family farms to raise. They, they own the barn. We supply the feed and supply the pigs with other family farms to uh, raise our pigs for us on their own buildings, and that way they, they have the income for their farm and their families to do the same thing we did on a smaller scale. So we would supply somebody to help the uh, oversee their pigs and mark their pigs and their vet services and so forth. Yeah, so the way it works is I have a farm in Indiana and I say, man, I, I want to have pigs, but uh, this is a, a changing industry. I build a barn. I put your pigs in there. You pay me to take care of those pigs. Then I put the manure on my fields and then you market the hogs, right? That'd be, that would be correct. If you have a son who want to come back home and need a little extra income, that would be a great opportunity for you. So that's how the hog industry has uh, evolved. And now... It's vertically integrated, but it's not completely vertically integrated, meaning you don't own uh, Tyson, but you own, you're an investor in a processing facility. Do you? Do your pigs always go to a place that you are part owner of? That's not correct. No, I I had an opportunity to be more integrated, so that's why we invested in the Clemens Food Group and went to their packing house in Coldwater, and also we go to their packing house in Hatfield, Pennsylvania. Okay, so two of the places go, your, your stuff goes generally to two processing facilities. That's correct, and then I have an opportunity to go to two other facilities. Okay, the Biden administration came out on Monday, uh, January 3rd, and announced a billion dollars is going to be thrown of taxpayer dollars at meat processing to the purported uh, reason is to lower prices for the consumer. At the consumer level, pork is up double digit percent. Uh, beef is up 20 or 25 percent at the consumer level year over year. I think poultry is up maybe 9 to 10 percent year over year. So there is some, some screaming going on. Uh, at the consumer level because we've had such cheap food for so long they've never seen this. Um, but the Biden administration, my concern is I don't think that this, I'm not sure it's, it's a bit ambiguous where it goes and how it's going to get applied. Do you see this doing anything for you? Well, there's a lot of confusion, and I have to admit, I don't understand it because I know there was $500 million back in the summer for small packing facilities. There's $150 million for COVID relief to small facilities. So, a billion dollars that was thrown out. Uh, I can't say I understand all of it, so uh, I'm willing to try to understand, but I don't believe it was for the larger packing facilities. I know there's some foreign ownership that I don't think they need their help, but I guess I'm still waiting to maybe understand that we can talk some more about it. Okay, so since you and I are, we're as knowledgeable, you're more knowledgeable about it than me because you are producing 700,000 fat hogs a year plus 700 and some fat steers. Uh, I am certainly more knowledgeable than most, and I'm still confused because, as you said, there was an announcement in late summer to early fall that they're going to throw half a billion dollars at small meat processors. And then I said, okay, when, where, how does it work? And nothing has materialized. And that's been five, six months, right? That's correct. And so we don't know anything. And then they say, well, now it's a billion. Is that encompassing the 500? We don't know. And then you alluded to foreign ownership. Go ahead and uh, the thing that we're talking about there is Smithfield. Well, Smithfield's a large company owned by foreign ownership. JBS is a large company owned by foreign ownership. And, uh, uh, but they have American management. And, and, um, and American processing facilities. And American processing facilities. And uh, I know there's a lot of uh, uh, people that uh, has some issues with it, but I guess they are American management and American ownership right now. So I'm not saying that I do sell 
to one of the companies. Uh, I'm not saying that they're uh, Americanism. I believe in Americanism, but um, you know we have to understand they are doing the job and they are keeping in America. And I guess uh, they do export some, but that's not their goal to export to overseas. And I don't think that's the reason why the product is high. Yeah, they didn't buy, they did, JBS, Brazilian owned company and Smithfield, Chinese owned, they got into and, and keep expanding because it's a consolidating industry, right? That's correct. You know, when you were a kid out here raising hogs in Ohio, you had more places to go with your fats, right? That's correct. And so we've got bigger processing facilities owned by fewer companies and even not as many processing facilities. That's correct. And that's not the only business that's been consolidation in either. <laughs> yeah. Every, everything has been this way. So uh, that's, in your opinion, not why meat is, is going up in price at the grocery store. Not at all. Um, there are four big companies that control the beef. Let's call it what? Cargill, Tyson... JBS and I think National Beef maybe, yeah. and then on the pork thing we've got kind of a similar thing. Smithfield Chinese owned, Tyson Tyson, JBS JBS Clemens is Clemens also is group. In there. Okay, so you've got these big processors, and so it's almost like I'm seeing conflicting messaging. And it's maybe because we've got an administration that doesn't understand economics or business or agriculture or all of the above, making prices cheaper for the consumer. Giving money to small processors, does it accomplish that? If that's what they're doing, if that's what the part of this billion dollars is supposed to do, going to small processors, does it make it cheaper for the consumer? Well, I'm all for the small consumer, don't get me wrong. The small processor. The small processor, I'm sorry, the small processor. But I'm, I think they all have a place in, in part. I know the processors in Ohio are doing great right now because of COVID, uh, and I don't know how to say it because they're all busier and all get up because of uh, everybody staying at home and cooking more, and they're doing great. I think they're all entitled to a, a, a part of the pie, I should say. But are they, uh, I think you made a great scenario when we talked here a minute ago, uh, can you make a co uh, Toyota in the back of Ed's shop or a, a car? I mean, I think that was a, uh, I like you made a comment or something. I, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm all for small meat processors because I use them. But if the goal is to cheapen the meat product for the American consumer, uh, a bunch of stuff going to small places maybe doesn't, well, it can't, period, on an economic basis accomplish that. Again, if I want a cheap automobile, I want Toyota to be ramping up car production versus them saying, hey, Jim and Damien, why don't you build a couple of cars in your garage? Well, I can't possibly compete on a price level with Toyota. E efficiency is where the name of the game is, and I guess, uh, uh, and sustainability for the long term. I I think we have to be efficient with our uh, our money right now. Uh, we keep handing out. I, 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 every time they hand out a trillion dollars, I go back and look what the budget is. I I keep thinking we handed out three trillion dollars, and I look and we have a five trillion dollar budget. Where did it, where's it come from? Yeah. And and we keep printing money. And I don't understand. I think it's all it's great for these low interest loans and grants, uh, but where do they keep making the money from? And is it going to be sustainable in the long term? No, of course I mean, not. labor, I know we, we looked and see where the money's being used at, but where labor is a real issue right now, and for them to say that they're going to use part of this money to train the workforce, I don't understand we got to find a workforce. Yeah, so uh, I've read the statement from the White House just sitting here with you, and they're saying $375 million to make gap financing grants. I'm not even completely sure I know, I know what a grant is. I know, I know what gap financing is. There's been times when you needed a, a little bit of money to go from here to there. So are they saying, we're going to give you this grant just to cover until you can get a loan? I don't know. It's ambiguous as hell. Then they talked about $100 million for uh, another thing, and they talked about as much as $32 million, which is a spit in the wind out of a billion, that was going to go to get more small facilities, um, USDA or FDA inspected, so that they could do more processing. Those are all fine things that open up some capacity, but on a percentage level, you know, if you got rid of 70 more pigs per year through local channels, when you produce 700,000, does it make any difference? Well, not not at all, because there's only, I'm just really on this picture, I'm still a small producer compared to some of the larger producers around, and, and they're all looking for shackle space. We're up against needing more space now, and we're, we need space. Right. Okay. So 
then the issue is you need more processors. Um, this is a long-term thing. I can't, right now, I can't open a meat processing facility tomorrow. It's It takes, what, 18 months to even build one of these? Get oh, it? I would say uh, at the minimum, I don't know if you get permits now in 18 months. Yeah, so it's going to take two to three years to get these things built. If maybe part of this billion dollars is fast-tracking that, Jim, does that help us so that we get more? Will Will there be more processing come online because of it? I don't think so, no. I really don't. You You think that this billion dollars ends up being... I think this billion dollars is just use it and lose it deal, and they just start using it. I, I, I think there's a, the government could use it for some low interest money, some regulatory issues to be a whole lot faster for the yeah. meat processing facilities yeah. for small producers. So it might end up going, you know, my, my partner Todd uh, is in the pork uh, consultation business, and he said, okay, if it takes you $35 million to build a new processing facility that can, that can harvest 2,500 uh, – pigs a day which and he said is small that seems large to me but it seems small he said it's small he says that still ends up only taking five percent of the um, of the product of the capacity and that's going to burn up all of that 375 million dollars essentially that's so correct we don't even so we're and if if we did that it would add five percent to pork capacity still haven't touched poultry nor beef nor lamb that's correct. <laughs> that is right. We just hadn't even touched the, the problem. So yet. the billion dollars, even if it was well spent from the government, is so limited in terms of how much money it would take to build out more shackle space, as you say. That's correct. That's correct. <laughs> yeah, a new plant today has already probably since COVID hit because of all the steel and all the extra labor and extra costs. Uh, when they built the Clemens plant, for example, a $250 million dollar plant, it's every bit of 25% higher. Is that the one in Coldwater, Michigan? Yes. And so, then you are talking on that scale, of course. We're talking small. Well, okay. The Clemens Coldwater plant that you're an investor in, the price to make that, to open that, build that out five, four, five years ago was $250 million? Uh, and north of that, even. That's without land, utilities, and so forth. So, so it's, you could have pushed 300 Yeah. Okay. Could have pushed $300 million. What's the capacity there, Jim? That's 10000 a day. 10000 800. 800 pigs per day. Yeah. Okay, so yes, even if you said one fourth of that, again, you're talking 40 or 50 million dollars yeah. to build a smaller facility. What about the very small stuff? You know, the guys where you and I go and we buy a quarter of beef, um, certainly they could use the money to up, upgrade their facilities, and that's good for you and me. Does it help you? Well, it doesn't resolve the problem of, of shackle space. It doesn't resolve, you know, extra pigs per day and how many we can get moved through and the pipeline. And it doesn't probably make meat cheaper. Uh, you know, there's a reason why there's a consolidation in the market. Is it efficiency? Uh, is it is it logistics of movement? Is it getting more economics of quality of meat to the movement? I mean, there's a reason there's consolidation, I guess I've always said, and I've always learned in economics. So they said $100 million of this uh, billion is going to be devoted to worker treatment. And I didn't know if this was a giveaway to the unions, because it's being a Biden administration thing, made me think this might just be uh, a giveaway to the unions, because they the, the language from the White House press release said worker safety and some of these kinds of things. And then they said, and uh, for worker training. So who gets this money? And... Uh, you know, to say, oh, we're going to just give this money for worker training. Okay, great. We're going to just go down the street here and just start throwing money out and saying, you know, go go sign up. Where would that even go? Any idea? Well, I would like to know because um, being affiliated with some of the packers now, the worker, the labor situation in the packing facilities now are 10 to 15%. I don't think you can find any, and I know in the cattle and the hog situation, I don't think you can talk to any facility today it's not running at least 10 to 15 percent short on labor okay so that means if you're 10 to 15 percent short on labor in your processing facility does that mean that you're you're 10 percent less on capacity you are yes, right yeah i mean right. you, you you're you're having to slow down the lines yep. and put less animals through there uh period okay um other things that you see at your front step that the person doesn't at the uh at the consumer the Biden administration uh, billion dollar plan kept saying, and then Zippy Duvall, president of the American Farm Bureau Federation, said, we've got to figure this out. How is it that farmers are making very little and uh, while meat prices are rising? So I guess Zippy Duvall and the Farm Bureau is trying to say that the packer processors are making all this money in the middle. 
A, do you think that's true? There has been profit made in the packing industry, uh, no question about it. Um, uh, there, there has been there has been profit made in the packing industry. Do you think they're do you think they're just killing it right now while the consumers paying twenty one percent more for beef and fourteen percent or eleven percent more for hog for pork at the grocery store and nine percent more for uh, chicken? Is that all just now new margin for the processor? Well, their labor cost has risen like everything else in the whole supply mm-hmm. chain. Uh, there's no question it's a supply chain has drove prices higher. Yeah, uh, the I, consumers I, paying that. Uh, unfortunately, me as a as a uh, supplier to the the packer, I'm I'm going to take the blunt. Uh, I don't get any more to haul my pigs to market. Unfortunately, I'm paying a fuel surcharge right now. I'm paying higher costs for corn. I'm paying higher costs for my ingredients. I mean, for my my lysines, my proteins, it's all coming back to me, and there's nobody at the end of the line. As they always said, I'm the only person in the supply chain that buys retail and sells wholesale, and yeah, that's at been the, told. At the farm level, there's obviously truth to that. So here's the thing. You're, let's go backwards on this. You just said that while the consumer might be paying 21% more at the grocery store for beef, or whatever, 12, 13% more for pork, depending on the cut, of course. You yes. know, pork, pork loin is pork chops are more than sausage, whatever. We, we know that. You're saying that just got gobbled up on all the human hands and the fuel yep. and the electricity, which is my big point has been we've got an issue of regulation. Yep. We've regulated essentially by government decree, we're paying people to not work. So that boosts the price of labor. That's a regulatory cost. We're, um, We're regulating green energy, increase the price of electricity. Everything that you eat that's meat has been refrigerated and or frozen. Uh, Then there's the fuel. We shut down uh, pipelines, fuel immediately went up 50%. That's regulation. So is it just a matter of regulation? Well, there's a lot to that. I mean, uh, I'm paying higher than ever for heating, uh, propane, natural gas at my facilities. Uh, Everybody wants uh, labor, you know. I'm driving a truck now. I used to be able to push paper once in a while, and I'm not here driving trucks because I can't find labor. So, you so know, that's my woes. So, so. you actually in, are having less office time to run your business because you're still out there. You have to be out there. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad I got two sons to take care of. I'm not, I'm not a good paper pusher anyway. I got two sons doing the work for me now, and I'm out there doing the the uh, what I want to say. I'm the well, I call myself the firefighter now. I'm putting out the the uh, the day to day stuff, keeping the, the operation. Well, I remember, going. there's a lot of people that uh, don't fully get it. You know, there, there's some people that think that when they pick a picture of a hog farmer, they think it's some guy in bib overalls holding mm-hmm. a squealing pig. And then there's other people that uh, don't understand. There's an amazing amount of business behind this. You've got how many? How many contract barns growing pigs for you? About a, there's about 170 barns and 150 uh, contractors for me. Okay, 170 barns operated by 150 contract growers for you. This is a major business, plus your own barns that you produce, the sows that produce the piglets. Yes. Is how many barns, how many sow facilities? Four. Four. Okay, so you got a lot going on, let alone now you're getting calls, and this is something you just told me before we started recording. You're getting called because the facilities... That you still and I believe also most of this, most of this gouge at the market at the grocery store has nothing to do with these packers piling it on. I'm not I'm not saying they're not making money, but they didn't just double prices on stuff and no. pu- and push it to this. It's it's a matter of they've got increased costs. Oh yeah, I mean there's no question. We uh, we have some of our monthly meetings as suppliers to the packers and. Their their uh, amount of wages they're paying over the last year and a half has definitely gone up as it uh, over the year and a half and and with everybody in every every sector of business uh, no matter what you're doing whether what widget you make or what widget you buy you go back and look at the supply chain uh, truck drivers to uh, to bakers to whatever everybody has to pay more wages this day and age everybody's making more money today and uh, they are so uh, except you know, for me, no matter what you do except for me and maybe not you well Mr. I don't know I maybe I, I don't know if I can hire you next time for I want I want that so mr. Heimer will answer me this uh, there's some people that say wait a minute I'm trying to figure this out. The Biden administration and the American Farm Bureau Federation came out, and they're anti-packer. They are against these meat processors. And we've had a packer meat processors have had a black eye since Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle back 100 and some years ago uh, about the horrid conditions in the Chicago meat processing facilities. 
you're kind of defending them. You're kind of saying, hey, it's not it's not the processors that are commonly called Packers. It's not the Packers that are, are uh, doing this to the consumer. Well, they, they they got a tough situation. You know, they're like everybody else that has to find the workers to work there. It's not it's not an ideal situation to work in a packing facility. They're standing there on the line. They've had COVID there just like any other facilities. Or it's something. cold. Yeah, they're it's cold. They're working there. And they're, it's physical labor. They're they're working tough. Uh, it's a tough situation to work in. Um, yeah, any but any producer will sit here and complain about the packer, but it's a love hate relationship. It's like you know you're selling to them. They're, they they aren't paying enough. We all have that relationship. But at the end of the day, we they need us. We need them. It's a, it's a working relationship. We have to work together, and we all have to be a team. You talked about before we hit record that these packers, because of employees, which tends to be the biggest issue right now, they are slowing down, and you're getting cut back on what you can send them. Kind of walk us through that. Well, when the, when COVID first hit, um, COVID hit their facilities, uh, and uh, uh, beca- uh, because of the close pro- proximity of the workers yeah. in there, and yeah. COVID hit them, there was some bad press that was hit out some Western facilities of COVID and COVID related deaths out there. Uh, right now, we haven't had it. We had a pretty good issue or a pretty good run uh, without COVID, and now we're starting to get some calls uh, and call offs of workers at these facilities of COVID. And we're actually got a call last week from a facility that's uh, going to cut back on our uh, our processing of pigs and harvest of pigs. So. Um, Pigs are gaining so much every day if pigs get too heavy, which can happen weekly. We have to sell so many pigs this week or the next week they're too heavy and we get docked on them. Well, we get a call off next week and we're going to lose 10% of what we can deliver next week. So the following week, we'll get a do- monetary dockage of pigs on that and we won't be able to get them in because of their workers are not there to harvest that facility. And, so, that, and that money goes away. It never comes back. Oh, it's a, it's a perishable item. It's just like when tomatoes rot in your field, we got pigs in our barns we can't stop feeding them that's inhumane we, right. our pigs are our, our number one thing is tearing for our pigs and if those pigs get over that weight range and those packers are docking us for them we can't gain that back and the packers aren't docking you because they're trying to screw you they nope. don't have the capacity well you don't want to buy a pork chop too big i mean there's such a thing as uh there's a that yeah. pork chop has to fit in that container has to fit in that box so you're sending pigs that are heavier because you're being held back because of capacity at the facility yep. because of worker shortages yep worker so, shortages and so there again if they can't it, you know, if if demand remains constant and supply is constrained, which it is, yep. prices go up. Yeah, and it's costing you. Yeah. Um, twenty twenty two. Here we are. We're recording this at the beginning of twenty twenty two. Outlook. What do you think? Um, we're hoping for a good year. Our exports in the pork business is what we live and die by. Uh, by the sword, I guess we export about thirty percent of all pork made in the U.S. Uh, so as long as exports stay strong, China was our China, Mexico, and Japan's our biggest export market. China is a um, what I want to say a, 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 uh, a son of a bitch. <laughs> well, I didn't know whether he's allowed to say things like that on this station, but uh, yeah. uh, there are what do you call a uh, loose, can, loose cannon? Uh, to yes. uh, they either come and go, they either they they buy a bunch and then they just take the day off waiting for the price to get better. And, and uh, they were up sixty percent one year and down fifty percent the next time. So China's our adversary. Frankly. Yeah, but, we look for them too much, I guess. But as long as they come through, they have a a, a tough disease over there. Uh, just like the corn and soybean market depends on them so heavily, and it's a crop farmer. But uh, we're hoping they come back. They were down the last six months of last year. We're hoping they come back and buy a big chunk. Um, so you're you're going to have a struggle still on the fact that you know, the places where you send your pigs and you're on a contract, you you know, and it's a the person listening doesn't understand. Say, well, just find somewhere else to take them. Well, it's real hard to do. We work years to get that, and we're fighting right now. All the boats sitting out there yeah. on Long or on Long Beach, and over here on this side, we got to get them boats. And if they can't turn them boats, we're just as sectoral as everybody waiting on their yeah. their last Christmas yeah. order they didn't get. You need boats to take pork away from our shores. And exactly. Also you need the process. But just to explain it to the person that I understand, because they say, "Well, gosh, if his place tells him we're cutting back and your pigs are getting heavy and you're going to get a, a price dock for that." Why not just find another processor? How hard is that? There, we are running almost uh, ninety. I don't know the exact number. Ninety-eight percent of the shackle spaces is the amount of 
places that pig can run in there and a, a, a shackle space is what exactly where the hog room. gets hung yeah 98 percent. there's no room at the end <laughs> so answer me this the billion dollars which is what we're talking about again how could it help you how could this billion dollars help jim heimerl of heimerl farms i don't think it will help us and sustainably in the long term i mean for somebody to kill 50 in ohio I look around the state, I'm all for helping the small producer, but to kill the amount to, that we're talking about in this, in the long term, I don't see it being there. Uh, our pork industry... It just doesn't add enough capacity. It doesn't add a enough million capacity dollars couldn't... in cattle, poultry, and okay. pigs. What if it was think. $10 billion? Would $10 billion add enough capacity? Well... Then the government's involved, and you wonder about the efficiency. <laughs> I, I worry about the efficiency. I don't think... the go, If the end game is cheaper food, I think you're somebody's got to pay the bill sometime. I always worry about who's paying the bill, and that's the consumer, and the consumer is the one that's looking for the cheaper food. Well, it's not going to happen. You're saying that this billion-dollar thing doesn't create cheaper food? No. Okay. I can say that. I can say that and with the limited knowledge I have, I would say that was not what the. And the limited was. knowledge isn't that you're not knowledgeable about meat processing or pork production. It's that we don't know for sure how the money is going to be spent. Exactly. But no matter how, what we've read, again, $375 million of new facility or gap in financing. Now, there are going to be some winners. Who's going to be a winner out of this? Well, I, I think people can upgrade their facilities. Some of these uh, smaller, these smaller facilities and these low interest loans, they can upgrade their facility and and make them uh, better than what they have. I mean, they've been really busy. I know in Ohio who these facilities uh, at our county fair, and that's what we're doing here, the fat fair program here. But they've been they're booked up for some of them six months to a year in advance, trying to get a process in the local beef and some of these processors. They're really important to us at our local fair. They've been booked up for a year. Yeah. They do a tremendous uh, harvesting of deer during our uh, deer seasons here. They're booked up for a year. They've been better than they have been five years ago. There's a lot of them that turned over in our area just because of uh, not having enough business. Yeah, so the person, the, the winner might be uh, a very small facility. Yeah. And then is there any of that mid-range? It's, you know, is there anybody that's in that mid-range like... Okay, they're bigger than your neighborhood place, but they're certainly not Tyson. Do they get any benefit out of this? You know, I don't know. I guess I can't answer that. There's, the people is killing 100 pigs a week. Yeah. I, I don't know if there's anybody that would come on. I know there's about one or two in Ohio. Do you see yourself being the kind of place that kills, kills 100 pigs a week? Uh, You're going to stick with what you do. Yeah. What about beef? You sell 700 and some odd fat steers a year. Where do those go? Uh, they're still going to the bigger facilities. I mean, there's always going to be that place that would be that niche market that's farmed fork yeah. that somebody wants to have the uh, uh, that organic restaurant. Well, the, do those benefit from this billion dollars? Maybe. Maybe. Um, whether that they're going to, but that's not the the end game of. Cheaper food. Cheaper food. That, yeah. That's that's your high dollar yeah. double. Yeah, the yuppie, the yuppie in the suburbs of Cincinnati that is willing to pay, you know. Yeah. Twice, that's not your cheaper food. That's not going to be cheaper food at all. It's So that person might be, it ended up might be that those people are benefited more than the cheap food crowd. Yeah, but that's not the, that's not what the end game here is. Yeah, so if we open up small, small niche processing facilities with some of this billion dollars, it, it's, it does a great thing for the foodie that wants to, you know, have organic, grass-fed, small scale, et cetera, et cetera. But it certainly didn't lower yeah. any price at the grocery yeah, store. I mean, if you want your Wagyu beef that they fed beer to at home, I, I don't know. I'm just guessing here. I'm just above so, my pay grade. All right. His name is Jim Heimerl. If you want to find him, he's been a client of mine. He's a smart dude. He's a hog producer and a beef producer and a, and a grain producer. He's in J Johnstown, Ohio. Go to Heimerl, H-E-I-M-E. E R L Heimerl Farms.com, and you can send him an email. He probably won't be able to respond because he's going to be out driving a truck because he can't get employees to do that for him right now. Uh, my name is Damian Mason, reminding you that if you uh, also want to up your farming game, check out the great work I'm doing over at Extreme Ag. That's X T R E M E, Extreme Ag.farm, Extreme Ag.farm, a uh, consortium of high yield farmers that are doing cutting edge stuff, doing trials, product trials for companies, new advanced technologies, new experiments on the farms and practices. You can check that out at extremeag.farm. It's the Cutting the Curve podcast that I'm helping them create. I encourage you to check that out. Till next time, thanks for being here, Jim. 
All righty. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good day. You bet. Till next time, it's the business of agriculture. This episode of the business of agriculture was brought to you by Land Trust. Landowners just like you are increasing profitability by adding recreation to their portfolio of land use. Millions of recreators actively seek wide open spaces for bird watching, photography, hunting, fishing, horseback riding, and many other farm and ranch activities. Owners of farm and ranch properties are partnering with recreation access network Land Trust. Land Trust is an online platform connecting recreators with landowners for outdoor experiences on their land to increase profitability. Visit LandTrust.com slash BOA, as in Business of Agriculture, to learn more. That's LandTrust.com slash BOA.